Before Will Smith, Gregory Hines, and Michael Jackson, there was Sammy Davis Jr. If it wasn't for Sam, we wouldn't have a lot of the entertainers that we have today. Because he was the first. He opened the door. Davis spent a lifetime bucking the odds, fighting, loving, and performing with consummate passion. How many were going to pick you to be your guy? And the only way I knew how to get even was not go on a tower with an automatic rifle, but to get even with your talent. My father set standards and everything he did. I mean, it was amazing. He's so, he's so amazing. In the next two hours, we will explore the controversial life of Sammy Davis Jr. We'll chart the ring-a-ding rise of a man who was born into poverty and won the respect of kings and presidents. We will learn about Sammy's love-hate relationship with his powerful mentor, Frank Sinatra. All right, folks, put on your sheets and we'll start the meeting. Oh, Sammy was always afraid that Frank Sinatra was going to do to him what he later really did to Peter Lawford, cut him off and never come back. We will hear about Davis's compulsive romancing. There were lots of them all the time, everywhere. Just lots of them. And the love so dangerous, it had to be kept secret. Harry Cohn wanted him beaten up, break his knees, and maybe put out his other eye. We will see how Davis suffered for marrying a white woman. We had, at home, and on the road, they had bodyguards all the time. We will observe how Davis was trapped between two worlds. They could be devastating. You could feel like a person, like a man with no country, no race. We will watch as Davis ran from his pain until he just couldn't run anymore. If they took his voice box out, he wouldn't be able to sing. And Sammy said, if I can't sing, I don't want to live. This is the story of how one man's demand for the best took him to the top and the price he paid to get there. This is the story of Sammy Davis Jr., the E! True Hollywood Story. On May 18, 1990, the neon lights of the Las Vegas Strip were darkened for 10 minutes. It was a tribute to Sammy Davis Jr., who passed away two days earlier. His funeral was absolutely spectacular. <laughs> he would have loved it. You would have assumed that the chief of state had died. I believe he, he wore an eight and a half, but I mean, to fill that shoe, he would have to be good. <laughs> Real good. When he was on the stage, he wasn't black, he wasn't white, he was Sammy Davis, and nobody could touch him. Privately, 34-year-old Davis admitted to friends he had a penchant for white women. But his liaisons were generally sexual, nothing to get serious about. Until one day in early 1960, when he walked onto the Fox lot and spied a Swedish actress named Mai Britt. I was working at a time on a movie called Blue Angel. And he came into the commissary with a friend of his, an actress that worked on the movie I was working in. And uh, I was sitting alone at the table, eating lunch, and uh, he said, um, who is that? And she uh, told him, and he said, can I meet her? And she said, forget it, she's very absorbed with work, and nobody uh, <laughs> gets to her or anything. And uh, I guess that's the impression I gave, because I was so enormously shy at the time. The 24-year-old actress had been making movies in Europe since she was 18. Davis was intrigued. Brett was not. At least, not visibly. I didn't seem very interested at first, but uh, I think I was. <laughs> but sometimes you have to cool it. <laughs> Mai's apparent indifference only made Sammy want her more. Friend Amy Green Andrews remembers being at a restaurant with Davis. And all of a sudden, Mai comes out and he starts trembling. I'm saying, what's the matter with you? <laughs> You're like, what is wrong with you? You got the chills? And he said, that's the most beautiful 
best thing I've ever seen in my life. In order to succeed, Sammy Davis Jr. would not take no for an answer. And that's the same way he pursued my Brit. One time he had a party up at his house and he always had a screening of movies up there. So he invited me for that. And um, from that time on, we started to see each other. Davis fell hard for Brit and the feeling was mutual. Actress Diane Carroll. She is one of the most loving people I've ever met in my life. And she loves Sammy deeply. Um, I think it was an experience that he'd never had because of the purity of it. That's what I saw about my. Dean Martin's daughter, Dina Martin. You would catch him out of his good eye, you know, staring at her. Um, he, he just, he really adored her. I believe that Sammy was in love with my Brit. Uh, I think that there's some psychological needs, the fact that she was blonde, like Kim Novak, like he wanted to prove that he could have anyone that everybody else would want. When Brit went to New York to shoot a movie, Davis phoned her almost every day. She proposed actually over the telephone because at that time I was in New York City doing a movie called Murder Incorporated. And he called me there and he proposed over the phone and I said, I think that would be wonderful. And they had great problems because a tall, blonde, beautiful Swedish lady in the streets of New York could not walk down the street with a little black person. That was the beginning of Sammy's bodyguard. The bodyguard would go in, the limousine would open, we'd all go in, then we'd get out in a restaurant. That's how it went. The wedding was set for October 16, 1960. That summer, Peter Lawford's brother-in-law, John F. Kennedy, ran for the Democratic presidential nomination. Kennedy was already tight with the Rat Pack, and his humanistic ideals appealed to Davis. Sammy campaigned vigorously, going into each and every black community they could go into and getting the vote out, and he really worked very, very hard. Both he and I worked very, very, very hard. But not all Democrats looked favorably on Sammy's impending wedding. Many blacks felt Davis was trying to be white. On the other hand, when Davis appeared at the Democratic National Convention, the white Alabama and Mississippi delegations booed. In 1960, it was illegal for blacks and whites to be together uh, in 36 states and uh, at least 15 states they were still prosecuting people for doing that. Davis worried that his marriage might harm Kennedy's chances especially since Sinatra, a highly visible Kennedy supporter, was to be Sammy's best man. Sammy decided to postpone the wedding and he told Sinatra before he told Mai. He lied and he said, I can't get the hotel room and the rabbi can't make it. And he made all these excuses. And Frank said, you know, you don't have to do this. And, and he said, no, I want to. Sammy was very close to all of the Kennedys and uh, with the, the guys, <laughs> Sinatra and Dean and Peter Lawford. Because it was election time, we figured that it would be best to just spawn it for a while. On November 8th, Kennedy beat the Republican candidate, Richard Nixon, by a narrow margin. Five days later, Davis and Britt were married in a Jewish ceremony. After his public and private support of JFK, Davis expected to attend the inauguration, but he was in for another disappointment. He and I were disinvited from the inauguration because it was an interracial couple. It was explained to them in great detail, great apologies were said, but that's, they could not stand side by side together. Sammy was crushed. Sammy felt this very, very deep wound that I don't know that he ever really got over. Because here he was working so hard with the black community to get them to vote for John Kennedy. Sinatra produced the inaugural gala, but Dean Martin, who was a close Kennedy friend for many years, boycotted the festivities. I think he was so mad with the Kennedys um, for hurting Sammy so badly, but Dad never even went. In December 1960, Mai announced she was pregnant. The press went to town. Sammy was so tired of the questions when they said, well, Sammy, uh, what color is the baby going to be? He said, look, I don't care if the baby is polka dot. I'm going to love this child. And so then 
that went on, the polka dot baby went on and on. Mai gave birth to a girl, Tracy, on July 5th, 1961. The couple later adopted two baby boys, Mark and Jeff. We discussed that before we got married. And we both decided that there are a lot of children that needs to be taken care of, aren't always wanted. And it would be uh, wonderful if you could do, help out. So we uh, tried our best. Mai willingly gave up her career and devoted herself to the family. But this was no leave it to beaver life. Son, Mark Davis. There was a lot of times we had to stay in the house um, just to be safe. I mean, uh, there was death threats. And if we went anywhere, somebody had to go with us. Uh, we were never alone. We had, uh, at home and on the road, we had bodyguards all the time. And uh, they just became part of the family, kind of. Britt learned to handle the hostility, but it wasn't always easy. Some things, you hear them and you hear bad words towards you, but when you got to learn to uh, go in one ear and it has to go out the other because if not, it drives you crazy. And once you've learned that, you, you kind of <laughs> goes right through with that. <laughs> it's not as easy as that, but you have to train yourself a little. If Mai was an adoring mother, Sammy was an absent father. Davis was on the road 50 weeks out of the year. You might think it might be great saying, hey, you know, my father was Sammy Davis Jr. But if you didn't know him, Work wasn't the only reason Davis stayed on the road. Sammy's hectic schedule provided some escape from his emotions. Sammy Davis Jr. was always in pain, but he didn't think about the pain when he was running. And so there was always something happening. As he approached 39, Davis kept the candle burning at both ends. Sammy would do two shows, a dinner show in Vegas, a midnight show in Vegas, and then he'd do a show for all the, the other performers in Vegas, and then he'd show a movie, and then maybe he'd sleep for, you know, a couple hours, you know, usually with his clothes on, just, you know, fall asleep on the couch. He just didn't have time to sleep, because he just had so much to do. The one person that Sammy Davis Jr. did not enjoy being alone with, and I know that as a fact, was Sammy Davis Jr. Not that Sammy ever let himself be alone. Women love Sammy. Women who shouldn't have loved Sammy love Sammy. And women who Sammy shouldn't have loved, he loved back. <laughs> there were lots of them all the time, everywhere. Just lots of them. I think it made him feel really very, very good that he, he needed that. Coming up, one of the first poachers, which was Sammy and Paula Wayne, the blonde white girl, resulted in windows being shot out at the Majestic Theater. And later, Sammy always hated the song Mr. Bojangles because it really was talking about one of his greatest fears of being broke. By 1964, 38-year-old Sammy Davis Jr. endured rejection and death threats because of his marriage to a white actress, Mai Britt. The controversy spilled over into his career, but Davis didn't buckle. That fall, Davis returned to the Broadway stage in a musical version of Golden Boy. Arthur Penn directed the musical. It's a very good story about a young musician who's also a fighter, and he sort of ends up sacrificing his musical career for the quick riches of the fighting game. In adapting the play for Davis, Golden Boy was given a racial twist that was radical for its time. Golden Boy producer, Hilly Elkins. He fell in love with the trainer's gal who was a white girl. And so it was a story of interracial love, which was... Uh, a little bit of a problem in 64. 
The musical opened at New York's Majestic Theater on October 20th, 1964. It generated an extraordinary amount of both positive reaction and some very nasty negative reaction. Well, one of the first poachers, which was Sammy and Paula Wayne, the blonde white girl, resulted in windows being shot out at the Majestic Theater. One moment in the play was so controversial that extra security was needed. We had one scene we called the suicide scene where Sammy went upstage and he and Paul were kissed. We had a lot of security on that. We had used toilet paper come in the mail. I mean, it was really uh, very unattractive. Some of the hostility was aimed directly at Davis, who had to be accompanied by bodyguards during the show's run. We'd been a club in Buffalo and you'd hear the N-word and uh, Sammy would at times ignore it and at times would just go ballistic. Sammy was breaking down doors and he knew that he was and he knew that that hurt and he knew that it would be easier. Davis made himself available for civil rights events, often at considerable personal risk. Second wife, my Britt. He was doing work with Martin Luther King. He was down in the March on Selma and he was in Washington DC and was in several other places. I joined him in some but Sammy was not that crazy about it because he thought that would be a little too blow up uh, situation if we appeared together. Sammy's business partner, Cy Marsh. And I must also tell you, because I know I paid the money, that he also contributed a, a lot of money towards all these different events. He was doing, uh, at different times, a film, a television series, uh, a lot of concerts and benefits up to the zoo. He was just all over the place. But that was his nature. And I must say that although he was exhausted, the show never suffered because of it. He delivered. I knew that he was also personally wired very, very tight. He was smoking a lot. He was drinking quite a bit. He was expending a huge amount of energy plus feeling that he was in a vulnerable position, as well as being called upon uh, every free minute to appear somewhere in relation to the civil rights movement. So it was a life stretched very thin. Although Davis relocated his family to New York during the run of Golden Boy, he spent very little time with them. Son, Mark Davis. You knew, you just knew, you know, your father was Sammy Davis Jr. He worked so hard, <laughs> you know. Um, it was hard, I mean, it's hard to deal with him being gone. Even when he was home, Davis was surrounded by a crowd. They had this lovely townhouse uh, that he'd rented, and he gave these wonderful parties on Sunday night that everybody in town who was famous in show business would be there. Julie Stein and Judy Garland and Liza Minnelli, and they'd all get up and they'd sing with each other, and, they'd, and Julie would play his new songs, and Liza would sing them, and it was just fabulous. And my hated every minute of it, and it was Sammy's dream. As if he weren't busy enough, Sammy co-wrote his autobiography with Bert Boyer and Bert's wife, Jane. In August 1965, Yes, I Can was published and became an instant bestseller. While appearing in Golden Boy, Sammy was also approached by NBC about hosting a variety show. The program was the first headlined by a black performer since Nat King Cole went off the air in 1957. There were all these attractive young women in the company and certainly outside of the company. I mean, you know, Sammy was a big star. There's just no question about it. And he was personally very needy. He needed affection. He was always Tom Caddy around. That was part of his, uh, you know, he was tired. Nobody was around. He was bored. And uh, it was 2 o'clock in the morning. What do you do? Come here. I don't mean anything. Sammy's attention apparently meant something to at least one member of the Golden Boy cast. Lola Falana was a dancer in, in, in the show. And, you know, they went on a road, they dated, they went out together. Lola also loved him in her strange way. She wanted to be Mrs. Sammy Davis Jr. more than anything else in the world. Unfortunately, there was already a Mrs. Sammy Davis Jr. 
Mai put up with Sammy's cheating, but the marriage was beginning to show signs of strain. Monogamy was not a strong suit, and ultimately it, it became a problem. In early 1966, Mai returned to California with their three children. Sammy remained in New York to fulfill his Golden Boy contract. However, the monotony of a Broadway show was wearing on him. So I said, look, you're really feeling stir-crazy. I'll make a deal with you. We'll close early, in spite of the fact that we're doing business. My condition is we do it in London. And he said, okay, we'll do it in London. My condition is we do it at the Palladium, which hadn't had a legit show there. Golden Boy closed on Broadway in March. Davis resumed his frenetic life on the road while the musical was ready for the London stage. Events were brewing that would have a shattering effect, not only on Sammy, but on the entire nation. Coming up... He was devastated. Devastated, because he knew that. By 1967, Sammy Davis Jr.'s neglect of his marriage to actress Mai Britt was causing tension. But nothing slowed Sammy down. In early 1968, Davis was in New York rehearsing for the London opening of his musical, Golden Boy. On April 4th, his valet rushed to his dressing room and broke the news that Dr. Martin Luther King had been assassinated. I know he found it horrible. It was devastating. I mean, Martin Luther King was such a wonderful person, and, and to hear that he was killed was uh, an enormous loss for us all, no matter what race. Davis went into an emotional tailspin of alcohol, drugs, and overspending. He partied with rock stars like Jim Oil wasn't helping Sammy's family life. Finally, in mid-1968, Mai made the painful decision to separate from Sammy. She just said, I can't take this anymore. She said, and I never want to get to the point that I hate you. She said, because you're a nice person, but you're just pointed in the wrong direction. Now, by this time, I realize what's going on, and I'm caught up in the, in, it's like the, that mouse that runs on that wheel, and I, I can't get off it. Sammy was too much of an entertainer, and I was too much of a homemaker and a mother. And it's very difficult then to combine the, both of them. That fall, the London run of Golden Boy By then, Sammy's affair with Lola Falana was over, and the romance with Altavis Gore was heating up. When Sammy and Altavis returned to the United States, their relationship began to turn serious. In the meantime, Mai filed for divorce. The decree became final in December, just as Sammy turned 43. A wonderful thing with the divorce was that we remained good friends, and that I am very appreciative about. Uh, we were good friends the rest of his life. 